Hello and warm welcome to you all watching us live on Shaka Extra Time. Shaka Extra Time is a show that comes to you live every Tuesday. Hello Shaka. Hello Paul. How are you? I am terrific and uh, I keep liking your fashion statements. Well, I'll take that as a compliment, my friend. But uh, you are still making reference to Indonesia? Uh, this, you could call it Afro-Asian uh, fusion. Very interesting. Uh, those who were politically, of course, part of what was called uh, the non-aligned movement, which was neither west nor east. Well, now we are taking it to the east, okay? You might want to make reference to Shaka, because Shaka <laughs> is wearing some reflection of the Madiba himself. Well, uh, I can uh, also add that uh, this is now the Ndiho collection. <laughs> a warm welcome to you all our Facebook uh, followers are watching us uh, live. Uh, Shark Extra Time is a show that comes to you every Tuesday. And today uh, we are talking about a wider range of issues. But uh, we'll start uh, in uh, Egypt, uh, where the Africa Cup of Nations is underway. Uh, those who managed to make it to the Super 16 have uh, played. Uh, most of the teams are out. And now we are looking at a few teams that have managed uh, to... Uh, Ghana enough uh, goals or enough support uh, to continue. Uh, your thoughts, Shaka? <clears throat> it certainly has been a very interesting, uh, you know, uh, football game and uh, competition. Uh, it doesn't look very good uh, when you talk about the fellows. We're talking about Egypt. Egypt, of course, uh, has won it a record seven times. Mm -hmm. Won it all. And by the way, it was not supposed to be hosting this AFCON tournament. It was supposed to be hosted by another giant African football team, and that was Cameroon. And Cameroon, of course, uh, like Egypt, is also out. Cameroon was supposed to be the defending champion. Mm. They are nowhere to be seen. They are not defending the championship because they have been knocked out. Uh, what, what happened? Uh, the last time uh, we had uh, this conversation, we were talking about uh, so how some teams, especially like uh, Uganda, uh, some teams uh, uh, like Ghana, who are like, really uh, uh, surprising a lot of people. Uh, but uh, now we are down to some teams that uh, were not even anywhere in the picture. Well, it is very interesting that um, once in a while you get teams like uh, Madagascar, for example, surfacing. It has to be arguably the Cinderella team of the tournament, mm. Madagascar. And there are so many people who are rooting for it, including, of course, uh, President Rajo Arina of Madagascar himself. He was actually present, physically present, when they beat the Democratic Republic of Congo mm. in what do you call sudden death. And to his credit, uh, he managed to take uh, funds uh, right from uh, uh, his uh, home country to all the way to Egypt. Uh, he paid. He chartered the plane to take a lot of funds uh, to support uh, the national team. Very good. Uh, very good. As a matter of fact, uh, um, that is something that um, is missing uh, when it comes to supporting certain teams from certain countries. For example, a region where you and I come from, has never had any claim on the championship. It does not know how that golden trophy looks like. Maybe they don't know how to play the game very well. Uganda came very, very close. As a matter of fact, the last time I checked, uh, I was an undergraduate student in upstate New York, and uh, they reached the final vis-a-vis -vis the uh, Ghanaian Black Stars. And the Black Stars did it again. I think it was the second time, in fact, at that time that they had won it all. They beat Uganda 2-1, to one, mm. and uh, we didn't have much to celebrate. 
Shaka, what's uh, this uh, uh, thing about uh, 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 these teams, losing teams, firing their coaches? Uh, it's uh, kind of ironic. Uh, you have teams that have managed to make it uh, uh, to this uh, uh, great, great uh, championship. But at the end of the day, the coaches get uh, punished uh, because they didn't uh, perform uh, to a certain extent. Uh, but uh, when you compare that to, for example, African uh, leaders uh, who overstay their mandate, uh, they refuse to get away when, you know, why shouldn't the same yardstick apply to them, Shaka? Well, I think you have a point, especially if, in fact, uh, uh, that particular country has provided all the necessary means, the necessary tools, the necessary support in order for the managers, the coaches, and what have you, to do their job and deliver the goods. If also political leaders, whether they be presidents or prime ministers, whether they be governors and what have you, if they have had the opportunity, for example, like some of these have really had plenty of opportunities. Some of these have actually had the dubious privilege of actually being in the state house for more than 30 years. Mm. You're talking about a generation here. If you can't deliver really in three decades, when are you going to deliver? There should frankly be some kind of arrangement, some kind of way, some kind of people, some kind of, uh, you know, authority that would come and sit down with this president and with, or with this prime minister or governor and what have you, and say, you know what, your excellency, or the right honorable prime minister, you've had the opportunity to do your thing and beyond. You have not been able to deliver. I think it is really time for you to step aside, or at least to pass on the baton, so that someone else can come and score, because you can't simply hold the ball. You have to be able to dribble the ball. You have to be able to supply the ball, or give it somebody who is strategically placed or located so that they can score. If you can't score, even politically, I think it would only be fair that you go back home so that you can also begin a new term of retirement. Uh, how about, uh, in fairness uh, to some of those leaders, uh, they argue that uh, they are perhaps uh, the best uh, scorers on the team uh, and there is no reason uh, why they should play as a team rather play as individuals. But first of all, you could only make that argument, and that argument could only be valid if indeed you were scoring. <laughs> but if you are not scoring, Paul, then so, how can you possibly even waste time, really, to make such an argument? Wait, and besides, wait, wait a minute, Chuck, besides, wait a minute. Uh, there are those who argue that they actually they are the visionaries of those countries. They, they are, uh, their programs, what uh, those countries run on are their own visions. Uh, these countries are run as personal properties based on that vision that they have for, those, uh, 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 for that particular country. Paul, it is fine for you to talk the talk. But surely you should follow that by walking the talk so that your people can walk the walk. If your people cannot walk the walk, that means you have not, in fact, walked the talk. It can't just be about talking the talk. Let's face it, where is the beef? Well, OK, let, let's do a quick follow-up. Shaka, what's uh, your take on uh, Museveni's uh, $1 million uh, gift to Uganda cranes after they performed poorly? at the Afghan games in Egypt? Well, I think that, uh, you know, um, he's trying to be nice uh, by providing um, some, something uh, that makes the players happy and all that kind of stuff. But I think what is needed really is not simply reacting, it is initiating. You have to initiate by providing the necessary tools, the necessary training facilities, 
the necessary coaches and the managers and what have you, and to make sure that their morale is very, very high, so that at the end of the day, they can play and win. So are you suggesting that uh, this came a little bit too late? Yeah, I think it is good for, to thank the, uh, the athletes for the co their contribution uh, towards the national psych and all that kind of stuff. But uh, you know what? You really have to reward someone because they have accomplished something. And in this particular case, nothing? Well, you could say that uh, they were able to move in the knockout rounds. They are able to move in the knockouts run. There are a lot of other teams that uh, couldn't quite make it that far. Well, okay, let's uh, move along. Let's move along. Let's go to uh, Sudan. Uh, things are still uh, uh, standing as is. Uh, nothing much has happened, despite the fact that uh, the opposition and uh, uh, the current uh, military council, uh, the transition, have agreed to share power. I think that uh, we really need to be patient. Uh, we need to allow for some time uh, so that uh, something really uh, takes shape in Khartoum. First of all, I think we need to congratulate the people of Sudan. We need to congratulate the key players, uh, both the military council and uh, the leaders of the uh, uh, opposition uh, civil society, professional groups, and what have you, who actually reached a compromise. And this compromise, frankly, is very necessary. Because let's face it, uh, failure is not an option. Failure is not an option. They have already failed during the last 30 years that Field Marshal Omar Bashir was at the political harem of the Sudan. Sudan, the last time I checked, used to be the largest country in terms of land size in as far as Africa is concerned. Omar Bashir presided over the splitting of Sudan. Now Sudan is made up of two countries, and two countries, frankly, which do not function well. So I think that uh, Sudan can no But in fairness to Sudan itself, uh, it has uh, been, uh, there's been a semblance of peace and stability in uh, northern Sudan. It depends what you mean by a semblance of peace and stability, because uh, you cannot have peace and stability without having what they call social, economic, political justice for all the Sudanese. Uh, let's do a quick uh, follow-up uh, from Roman Atile. Uh, will uh, the Sudanese military agreement uh, with the opposition work, or we are looking at something that uh, uh, is akin maybe to what happened in uh, Kenya uh, during uh, that uh, power-sharing agreement, something that uh, happened in Zimbabwe uh, when uh, Robert Mugabe reached out to uh, the, the main opposition leader, Morgan Changarai? I think that uh, there is a precedence, at least uh, in the context of Sudan. They had uh, what you would call the, uh, uh, the agreement, basically, the comprehensive peace agreement. They had that, and uh, it resulted, for example, into the splitting of the nation, as it were. And now you do have uh, two Sudans. One is Sudan, whose capital is Khartoum. The other is the Republic of South Sudan, whose capital is Juba. And so I think there is a precedent. And frankly, as I said a little bit earlier, I do not think the players, Noah, or the people of Sudan, I do not think that they can actually have an option of failure. That is not a luxury they can afford. The fact that uh, they became conscious of the fact that neither the military can do it alone, Noah, the civilian opposition politicians can do it alone. I think they saw something very interesting because as somebody once suggested, Paul, as an individual, you can run very, very fast, pretty fast. But together, you can actually go and get very far. And I think we should really support the political compromise that obtains in Khartoum, where you have uh, what they call the Sovereign Council, made up of 11 people, mm -hmm. 
and six of these 11 people are non-military. Uh, let, let's do a quick uh, follow-up here. Let's, uh, there's somebody who wants you to talk about uh, the East African Fe Federation. Let's go to Halo Nzama. Is the East African Federation going to work? Uh, uh, maybe we can tie that to another question that has uh, been uh, coming. Uh, I think we tried to address it last time. Uh, will Uganda get to political maturity like Kenya? Well, first of all, uh, when you talk about uh, the East African Federation, the last time I checked, uh, there has not been or never been any such thing. I don't know anything called the East African Federation. Perhaps what I know he, is that uh, there is the East, East African, African community. community yep. But not the East African you know, Federation, because that would be a political arrangement, which would therefore mean that the member states that form up the East African community would seize their individual sovereignty so that they could actually form a political entity that would be headed by one political leader who would either be appointed or even better, perhaps better still, would be elected by the people of the East African community. There was talk initially about fast tracking mm -hmm. the federation, East African federation. But the last time uh, I remember, I had um, a live Straight Talk Africa interview or program from uh, the Tanzanian political capital Dodoma with the then uh, Tanzanian president uh, Jakaya Murisho Kikwete. We're talking about uh, 2007 here. That's a very long time ago. Uh, it, did, it looks like uh, there were a lot of problems. Tanzania, for example, was not ready for that. And uh, some other countries also did not seem to be ready for that except that uh, the Ugandan president, Yoweri Museveni, uh, happened to be splinting towards that, and uh, he was the elder statesman in the region. It was uh, assumed that he would have the opportunity and the honor to be the first East African head of state. It never happened, and probably won't happen on his watch. Uh, the, speaking of uh, federation, something remarkable just uh, happened uh, over the weekend. Uh, uh, 55 uh, African uh, countries agreed to a continental free trade uh, zone. Uh, I think uh, uh, by any measure or standard, that's a remarkable development, considering that uh, most of these uh, African uh, countries are not at par. And secondly, it's even, it takes longer to travel across uh, Africa. Your thoughts? You are talking about uh, the African continental free, free trade, trade area. So, yes, terrific. And I think, frankly, we should uh, uh, we should basically give credit uh, to the man who came up with that idea and pushed it, despite a lot of naysayers. And that is the Rwandan president, Major General Paul Kagame. Did, did I hear that very collectively? Yes, you are giving. He president deserves Paul credit. Kagame. Yes, he uh, deserves credit. I give credit to whomever deserves it, including President Paul Kagame of Rwanda. There were a lot of people who did not think initially that uh, that was something that was practicable, especially because initially two African giants, we're talking about Nigeria. And South Africa. Nigeria and South Africa, they are one and two in terms of the largest markets mm -hmm. and what have you. They were very reluctant to embrace the idea. But over the weekend, Nigeria finally accepted it to be part of the club. And I think it has a lot to benefit out of that kind of market because, let's face it, when you talk about uh, the African uh, continental free trade area, you are probably talking about uh, the largest market of that kind since the World Trade Organization. I mean, you're looking at about uh, $3.4 trillion uh, if uh, it, uh, it's implemented very well. Yes, and you are looking at uh, uh, 
a market of uh, at least about uh, 1.2 billion consumers. Uh, let me go back a little bit uh, to uh, Rwandan President uh, Paul Kagame. Mm. Uh, the point uh, you just uh, made uh, of uh, him uh, taking credit, doesn't this uh, vindicate him? Uh, uh, along, uh, there are people out there who argue that uh, he's arguably a visionary, one of those uh, guys who sees very far. And by him coming up uh, with this idea sort of uh, takes away all the other criticism that uh, we've been, uh, we are used to uh, talking about or reading in the news. It doesn't really take away the other criticisms, especially of uh, denying his people uh, the right to own an opinion that may be different, for example, from uh, the Rwandese Patriotic Front, uh, which is running the country, or that may be different from his. If you're talking about that, then we can look, we can put it in a broader historical context. We can look, for example, at a man called uh, Joseph Stalin. Joseph Stalin was a man who came to power in what was called the Soviet Union. In 1922, this is when he came to power, this is when the founding uh, father of the Soviet Union, Lenin himself, was bedridden yes. until he dies two years later. 1924. Stalin rules from 1922 to 1953. And arguably, you can say, without Stalin, you probably would not have had the Soviet Union then as it were as a superpower. He created a superpower. But guess what? In 1989, what happened? The Soviet Union collapsed. There is no such a thing as the Soviet Union anymore. At the end of the day, it is good to build markets. It is good to build roads. It is good to put in place physical infrastructure. But what you cannot dispute, what cannot be disputable, is the building of people's minds. What is very important is the freedom of human beings, the freedom to think. The freedom to think, because when you are a leader, it assumes that you are actually leading people. You are leading people. And if you are leading people, you cannot deny them the basic rights of thinking. Because a former US president, Barack Obama, actually said, even with the prosperity, without freedoms, it is a form of fundamental poverty. I couldn't agree with him more. Uh, I couldn't agree with him more either. Uh, another follow-up, uh, again, on Rwanda. Uh, there are critics who say that, uh, uh, yes, uh, this is great, uh, President Paul Kagame coming up uh, with this, but uh, he, he, can he look himself in the mirror? For example, uh, we are talking, it's been months, uh, the Uganda-Rwanda border is closed. So how do you justify? Isn't that uh, being a hypocrite? You're talking about having a continental free trade zone, and yet your own border is closed. Your own country is, cons is now technically a landlocked country. You know, Paul, someone once suggested that uh, human beings are essentially products who happen to be composites of contradictions and so are leaders. So in this particular case, you are actually describing or defining Rwandan President Paul Kagame as essentially a composite of contradictions. He's a human being. Interesting. He Interesting. gets some things good, and he doesn't get some things so, so good. So to human is error. And to forgive is divine. Okay, let's move along. Let's talk about uh, ECOWAS. Uh, ECOWAS is also doing something uh, interesting. Uh, uh, the 15-member bloc uh, over the weekend also finally agreed uh, to come up with a, uh, their own currency. Uh, I don't know what this means uh, for France, uh, because most of these uh, are West African, especially the Francophones, have been using a, a currency, the CFA, 
pegged to uh, uh, France. So what does this mean? Could France potentially go to war with some of these uh, African countries? I don't, know. I, don't decided... know. I don't know how it is pegged to France because the last time I checked, the French do not use the CFA. But they are the, the guarantors. They are the French use the euro. Correct, but uh, France is the guarantor of, uh, or the guarantee of uh, this uh, uh, currency. It controls, basically. Absolutely. It controls and... Uh, so prints. what does that mean for uh, the Africans, average Africans, the economies? I think it is really, it is a very significant first step in the right direction, if it can work. And I hope it works, really, because I think Africa needs those types of, uh, uh, you know, victories, really. Again, I often say that Africa is not poor, or Africans are not poor because Africa is poor. On the contrary, Africa is incredibly endowed with wealth. Perhaps the richest actual continent in terms of resources and what have you on this planet Earth. But unfortunately, Africa is not endowed with visionary leadership, there is some kind of leadership deficit to harness the potential that is there for Africa, to harness the potential, to make sure that you mobilize and use the resources for the benefit of the daughters and the sons of Africa. We need that type of leaders. Yeah. It is a high time we did. And in fact, we should borrow it from ECOWAS. Because ECOWAS, mind you, is not only championing this idea of a common currency in their region. They have already done something very remarkable when it comes to respect for democracy. You remember what happened to the Gambia? Correct. It was ECOWAS, not the African Union. Not the East African community, not SADAC, it was ECOWAS. So I think ECOWAS is on to something. And I hope and wish this something can actually be broadened to the extent that it becomes an African thing. Uh, let's do a quick follow up from uh, Robert Ochola. As long as Africa still recognizes colonial borders, there will be no unity. These trading blocks are just uh, fa uh, fallacies uh, that uh, are created in the morning and by the evening, there are no more. African leaders uh, are most visionless. Yeah, but you know, at the end of the day, I don't think that we as Africans should abdicate that type of responsibility to these people that we call leaders. First of all, a lot of these people are not leaders really because they are not chosen in a democratic way. A lot of these leaders, actually some would say the appropriate language definition would be rulers. But, but in fairness, uh, all these uh, West African countries uh, who came together in that block, they're all democratically elected, you could argue? Well, you could say that, uh, Yes, for the most part, you could say that. Uh, but I think there is a very long way to go. First of all, I think Africa, it's a high time. It has to embrace democracy. If democracy means a reflection of social, economic, political justice for every African. Very quickly, what are you talking about tomorrow? Tomorrow, we are going to be having a very interesting uh, discussion and uh, we are going to be uh, looking at... Yeah, uh, on, on that note, uh, thank you so much uh, for being another uh, terrific guest. Uh, I look forward to hosting you on another edition of Shaka Extra Time. Until then, so long from Washington. Thank you very much. Yep. And of course, uh, it is uh, the historical black colleges and universities. And it's impact on Africa.
Um, so Maya and I joke that we grew up surrounded by a bunch of adults who spent full time marching and shouting um, about this thing called justice, right? And the fight for justice and equality we know is something Coretta Scott King actually told us years ago. The fight